Welcome to the latest soccer down here, 1v1. My name's Jason Longshore, and we get to break a little bit of news today on the 1v1. With me is the new manager of the Georgia Revolution, Scott Redding. Scott, thanks for the time. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the invite. So let's start with the uh, the announcement. You know, you are now in charge of the Georgia Revolution, and this is not just your average hiring. You started with the club as a player at the beginning, and now you're in charge. You know, it has to have a little more meaning for you, having been through everything that the Revolution has been through from day one. Oh yeah, it's um, it's been quite a journey to see the to see the club grow in different ways. I mean, as you said, I had the privilege of being there all the way back when Rafe Moran started it. And um, ever since then, I've been a player, worked as an assistant coach, and uh, just now making it to the managerial role. And I'm very proud to be here. When did you decide that you wanted to start getting that experience on the other side of the touchline as an assistant coach as a manager working with youth when did that start to become a focus for you well honestly with me that started a long time ago um back when i was playing at wofford college um i would work at ralph lundy camps during the summer as i imagine most most of the soccer players did because you got touches and you got housing and um I at least noticed I truly enjoyed working with the with the youth players there. Um, some of the other guys, I feel like it was more of a paycheck and more just fun, but I actually got a lot of value out of it. And so I would reference all the way back to then when I was a collegiate player is when I really started to see that there is a coaching aspect that I could enjoy down the road from soccer as well. So I think with your experience with Georgia Revolution, you can probably tell the story better than anybody. You know, let's go back to the beginning and, and the days at, at Rockdale Youth Soccer Association and Rafe Moran getting the club started. What was it that attracted you to join the club in the first place? Well, I think a piece of the puzzle that most may not know is that before Rafe Moran was the <clears> – <throat> before he was the DOC at RISA – he was actually my collegiate coach at Wofford College for the first year. So that contact was already there. Um, as soon as I finished at Wofford College, thankfully he reached out to me, mentioned that they were starting an NPSL team, and asked if I would be interested in helping the team get, get going. And so um, that kind of streamlined. There were a couple of other teams that I was looking at as well, but that was having that relationship ahead of time helped make my decision pretty clear. And the team had some success straight out of the gates, both in the NPSL and in the Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup. There were some high-profile games early on with the Atlanta Silverbacks or in the early rounds of the Open Cup. And as Rafe left RISA, you know, things changed a little bit. Tell me a little bit about the transition from Rockdale County moving over to Henry County and the relationship with the Morrison family who now own the club. Well, yeah, those were turbulent years. I mean, if any time that you have the person at the head of the ship, you know, have to – he left and went to South Carolina. And so um, any time that that happens when the person at the top leaves, there's going to be a little bit of instability. So that's how – I mean, you never want to solely blame things that are off the field for the on-field results. But if you were a part of it, you just know um, that was a that was a large part of it, and thankfully – the Morrisons did come along. They're able to bring a little bit of stability and structure to the club. And it's been a process. I mean, some things completely out of our hands. But over time, they've continued to invest in the club, um, show worth to the players. And I think that is slowly but surely starting to pay off. Yeah, what's been really impressive to me watching the the move from Rockdale County to Henry County and, and everything that's going on, it feels very organic. You know, it feels very genuine in the way that a club can be built. And I think it's different than the way a lot of other clubs are built these days, whether it's NPSL or UPSL or, or League Two. It's not being done with huge resources. It's being done really step by step by step to build a sustainable foundation. I would agree. I mean, it's 
it's innovative um, to say the very least. Uh, it's a risk that most, I think most managers aren't willing to take that long. They'd rather, you know, throw a lot of money at it, go and get your franchise players if you have those resources and just try and focus purely on results. I think we're very blessed to have a manager, um, a general manager in Eric Morrison, who was able to take things, as you said, step by step, see the need for there to be a consistent year-round team through the ADASL and start to actually set some really roots, some deep roots for the club in that way, that there is a consistent place for the local players to play. And for some of the players who are perhaps on their way in, they can start getting touches early on, get to know some of the guys. Um, like you said, you don't see that happen very often, but I do believe that it, if you can afford to, that's the way to go because the foundation obviously is going to be the most important thing that you're building. Yeah, it's the sustainability, and it's something we talk about a lot on soccer down here because, look, it's difficult to, to launch a team at the lower division level. It is costly, and, and there's not any guarantee of that money coming back straight away. This is being built for the long term, and it, and it's sustainable. It's something that can you know, fluctuate a little bit based off resources that are available, but there's a foundation to build from. You mentioned the ADASL, and I thought that was one of the the real master strokes for the way that the Georgia Revolution are being built currently because previously with NPSL and PDL and, and other teams in the Atlanta area, it was all focused on a top team and a lot of times bringing in talent from outside the area. Those ADASL teams, and, and now it's multiple teams, <clears throat> really, it has become this place for local players to play. And you guys are becoming a club of choice for local talent in the Atlanta District Amateur Soccer League. Well, yeah, I appreciate I appreciate your saying that. And I, I completely agree that, like you said, we have um, teams from the PDL, from the UPSL, who are also entering teams in the ADASL now. And um, like you said, it's it's a way to keep the players involved. It's a way to kind of give a foundation, some firm roots. And I agree. Like uh, Eric Eric Morrison, he kind of uh, he looked at a few different leagues and settled on with the history of the ADSL, the consistency of it. It would be the best place to set a foundation for our team, and I think it's paying off. Yeah, it seems like it really is. It's, it's a credibility with the Atlanta District Amateur Soccer League. The ADSL you know, played its first season in 1967, there's not any other leagues in the area that, that have that level of, of credibility. And what I've noticed is now, because of the brand that, that you guys have built with Revolution, you're bringing credibility to the ADASL. And I think it was you know the, the Revolution who really helped start this era for the ADASL of, I think, a, a higher level of commitment to quality. You know, it feels bigger and more important than maybe it has in, in decades past. You know, I would, I mean, I may sound biased, of course, in my position, but I would agree. I think, I, I know at one point, um, was it last season, I, be, I believe, Atlanta United was putting one of their youth teams in there. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's something that would have happened in the past. And again, you have um, MOBA and Virginia Highlands. They both have teams who have, uh, have teams in the ADSL. And, you know, I, I do think that a lot of that has to do with our investing. We have three teams currently, and I know uh, Eric is considering a fourth perhaps, especially if our U23s continue to do well um, next fall. And, you know, I think we do have – we've helped the league move to the next level. At least I would like to believe that. But there's also teams, you know, like Majestic, who is consistently one of the best teams in the ADSL. They've been there forever as long as I, I mean, as long as I know and beyond that. And they've always consistently provided very quality, strong teams. So I have to give credit to them, first of all, because we wouldn't have interest in it if it wasn't for teams like that who have made the league as strong as it was when we started to enter. And it's that partnership. I mean, that's what a league like this is at a local level because Majestic, Wings, Terminus, you know, you've had some teams that have been around for a long time in the ADASL. But now adding the Revolution and Vahai getting bigger and bigger and, and MOBA being involved in it, it it's risen. And, and just like you know, we talked about credibility and, and building a, a product to make this a, a club of choice like you guys have, 
the ADASL has now become a league of choice for any serious amateur player locally, and it's becoming a place that you know players can develop in. I agree. I, I completely agree. I mean, I you know of course on Sundays we are competitors where you know every team out there wants to win, but I very clearly see a storyline where I look at Majestic, Terminus, Vahai. I look at these teams as iron sharpens iron, right? They help us get better. We consistently see players who we work with during our semi-professional team over the summer on those teams, and that, that doesn't bother me. As long as they're playing somewhere, they're getting stronger. I think, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. I, I couldn't agree more that it's a unified thing because it's, the storyline is clear where we compete on Sundays, but in the big scheme of things, I'm more than happy to have quality competition every Sunday. So tell us a little bit about how you go about now as the manager of the Revolution and the NPSL side and the top team. How do you go about identifying some of the talent for your various ADASL teams? And what's the pathway like from team to team to team? Yeah, so I will say, um, thankfully for me, um, Eric is actually... I mean, he doesn't advertise this about himself, but he is actually very diligent and extremely competent when it comes to recruiting himself. He is probably the most uh, valuable resource that we have in terms of recruiting because he spends ample amount of time watching collegiate games, working with agents. Um, I mean, his email box is probably flooded every morning. <laughs> so he helps he helps tremendously in that way, and he streamlines it for me just passing along players that – he knows our quality because he's done the research. So that helps a lot there. Um, in terms of the ADSL, I do have to make sure I'm keeping the competitor and myself in check and give props and recognize when we're playing against quality competition. I'll mention them to Eric, and he often follows up with the managers and the players individually to see if there's a availability and interest there for them. Um, internally, I would say we do some very simple things that just help us to get a good quality look at players. Um, we make sure our two, for our, our ADSO, we make sure our 23s and our reserves train together. So I get to see those players multiple times a week. I'm always in conversation with Alec, who is the head coach of the 23s, who are in excellent form right now, by the way. Um, and the same thing with Sam. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to see the 21s as much, but I do speak with him. I've been to a couple of their sessions in their games. So it's just healthy communication between the coaches and, of course, organizing things on the back end is a way that we try to make a truly clear path for the players to progress if they're interested in playing semi-professional. I think for people who you know might not know much about the club or, or might not follow the lower divisions uh, deeply, this is not exactly unique, but it's not common in the United States and definitely not common here in the Southeast to have this deep of a, a squad for the overall club with three teams, potentially a fourth, and you as the manager in charge of the top team, having that communication, seeing those teams train, and getting an opportunity to continue to observe talent and grow the club as a whole, that just doesn't happen with that much you know, depth very often. Oh, I mean, you're completely right about that. And that's one of my pet peeves. I mean, it's the system is what it is. I, I think most people who have uh, studied soccer know that there, there's kind of a gap, I would say. Once you exit the youth soccer level at U18, U19, if you don't make college, then it's almost like everyone forgets about you. <laughs> and there's still so many players who... Maybe they're late bloomers. Maybe they just didn't have the right coach. Maybe they didn't have the resources. Maybe they didn't have the opportunities. And I think what we fortunately were able to do is to kind of create a safe haven and an opportunity for those players. I mean, we've had some outstanding players come who just never had a chance. You know, maybe the finances didn't work out. And I would say we have players who drive distances that I wish they didn't have to simply because there's not a lot of opportunity. Like you said, people... I think after youth soccer, there a lot of them is just interested in results or money, and they're not really there's no interest in developing the player, the human being, and we've tried to make sure that we provide a place for that to happen. And when you don't focus on the money or solely on the results, 
those things tend to happen anyways. Yeah, and all the way down to the point that the Georgia Revolution has a foundation that gets involved in local schools and has created a youth program as well. You know, this is a very holistic setup that we need to see more of, hopefully. I would lo- I would love to see. I mean, you you know, a lot of times there's a fear that if you're doing it, someone else will do it and, you know, you'll start to lose your players or whatnot. But I, I have no fear of that. I think the more people who are able to repeat what we're doing, the better for everyone. You know, it's, it's like you said, there's so much good to be done through athletics. And, you know, soccer is, of course, our passion. And if you know me personally, I can say this statement without having any concern that it's misunderstood. But it is a means to an end in many ways. The people that you reach, you know, we'll, we won last year and people won't remember that in two or three years. Um, but the individuals who maybe found a community, maybe made some better decisions, you know, the, the kids that we're reaching at the schools, that is something you can't put a price on. And I just, you know, to have a GM who actually shares that vision and supports it is, is just incredible to me because I mean, it's, it's, it's rare, very, very rare that people in athletics care more about the people than the results of the money. So now you take over the reins of the club. You're going to set the, the idea of how the Georgia Revolution will play from top to bottom. Who are some of the coaches that, that you look at around the world that inspire <clears throat> you and, and you learn from when you observe what they do? Um, well, yeah, I always wish I was more original in these, conversa- in these conversations, but I'm not. Um, I think anyone who saw Pep Guardiola in the the area, where, the the years when I really started to not just watch soccer for enjoyment, but in, but to study it, that was when he was at Barcelona, mm-hmm. and he changed the way everybody played the game. Everybody, I remember a statistician talking about the number of passes after Barcelona had the run that they did back in the Ronaldinho days. I mean, the number of passes that were completed, the style, everybody conformed, right? And so I think in terms of tactics, I draw a lot from that. But on the same end, um, more currently, I try to see a balance. You know, playing the small passes is great, but if you can't play the long game and threaten beyond the back line, you're, you're going to get stuck, especially if you don't have the players who can pull it off, so to speak. So... I mean, if you look at the way that Jurgen Klopp with Liverpool, the way that they can just break through the back line, or Tottenham as well, the way they can break through the back line so cleanly, you know, a well-driven ball to a, to a good run is just as beautiful to me as creating a couple of one-twos and overlaps and third-man combinations. So on a big scale, I would say um, Jurgen Klopp, uh, just, uh, not Jose Mourinho, I don't have nothing against him, but not Jose <laughs> Mourinho for me personally. But um, maybe the new one. He seems a lot happier now. But, that's um, a good. That yeah, that's a good observation. He doesn't seem like the Jose Mourinho that left Manchester. Maybe a little bit closer to the the Jose Mourinho who arrived in London with Chelsea. Maybe he's, it's a little bit of a throwback. <laughs> time will tell. They're doing pretty well right now, <laughs> and I guess time will tell. But. Yeah, I I love Pep Guardiola's style. I love the way that, you know, Jurgen Klopp, he gives his players a hug every time that they come off the field. Um, those are the coaches, I think, on a bigger scale. For me personally, I, I will always say some of the coaches I had growing up, some of the coaches I had playing for the Revs. I mean, Robin Dixon, um, he changed the way that I do all of my training sessions. Um, Greg Moss Brown, who works at Emory Oxford, is a, co- a college I used to work at. Um, his in-game tactics is fantastic. Dave Morris, I'm not sure anyone he he used to we used to work with him at Emory also. Um, just the management. There's so many different coaches who have had a huge influence with me, and you know I I still I give a lot of credit to them for what I where I am right now. What's the next for you that you want to learn and add to your repertoire as a manager? What are you focusing on developing in, in your abilities as a manager? Um, I would say that the places where I feel I have um, room to improve is when I'm working in a training session, 
I have a tendency to stick with a concept until I see it come to life, so to speak. And I know that that's not always the most beneficial way to do it. So I would say um, time management in the training sessions, because especially when you're playing in a competitive league, that's the NPSL, ADSLR, and you only get to work with those players a handful of times, that time needs to be used extremely well. right? And so time management there would be a big portion of it. And then in a bigger overall arching sense, you know, um, I watched a couple of documentaries on professional teams, and there is a bigger picture that has to do with managing the player's schedules from A to Z that I've not had the opportunity, honestly, to get involved at that level just yet. So I will be interested in that. And I would say one a third thing that is really of interest to me is I think that there is a lot of technology, honestly, available that you can begin to coach without having to see the players, whether it's using tactical boards or videos, those kind of things. And that's just um, that's an area I'd like to pioneer personally, learn more about, and see if I can, especially since there's such limited time, be able to work with the players even when I'm not there. Very cool. Well, people who are listening to this, I hope there's some new fans who are interested in what's going on with the Georgia Revolution, and they'll be checking out the website and following on social media. What do the next couple months look like for you in charge of the Revs? Well, we have tryouts, the first round of tryouts, uh, December 14th. So that's this Saturday at 12. So that's obviously a big deal for us. Um, That's step number one. After that, we've honestly been going, especially if you um, were in the spring ADSL, that rolls straight into NPSL, which rolls straight into fall. So I'm looking forward to relaxing, (laughs) (laughs) and just Christmas, enjoying family, those kind of things. And uh, relaxing is also a time when you recharge. I'll be doing planning. I'll be getting ready to make a strong push for the spring ADSL as well as start to look into a couple of players who maybe will um, start getting a... some rela- building some relationships for the summer as well. Um, yeah, those are the main things on the agenda for me. Make sure everybody out there listening, you are checking out GeorgiaRevolutionFC.com and following on Twitter, GA underscore revolution. Scott, thanks so much for the time. Best of luck in the new role. And we'll catch up with you again on a, I, I want to, we're going to have to talk about Jose Mourinho as Tottenham <laughs> continues to go and see where this ends up at the end of the season. All right, sounds good to me. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll be back with another 1v1 very soon. You can always check out Soccer Down Here every morning at 9 a.m. on the Soccer Down Here app, on Spreaker, and on SoccerDownHere.net. Thanks, y'all.